Jalal al-Din Rumi, born in 1207 and died in 1273. The 13th century of the Common Era and the 7th century of Islam was a different and challenging period in Muslim history. Having assumed control of North Africa, the Muslims successfully crossed into Sicily, Gibraltar and southern Spain before they began to knock on the door of mainland Europe. At the same time, in the subcontinent, Muhammad Ghuri became the first native Muslim monarch to rule India. As the Muslims made rapid political progress in both the East and the West, the Mongol hordes unexpectedly emerged from Asia and ransacked Baghdad, the capital of the Muslim world, leaving behind nothing but death and destruction. Political setbacks, cultural decline, a moral degeneration coupled with petty rivalries between the protagonists of different religious sects and groups led to intolerance, mutual hatred and animosity across the Muslim world. The core values and principles of Islam were ignored and openly violated in many parts of the Muslim world. From the chaos, the towering figure of Rumi emerged to champion the high values and principles of Islam's like never before. Jalal al-Din Rumi was born in the city of Balkh, in present-day Afghanistan, which at the time was part of the Persian province of Khurasan. His family claimed descent from Abu Bakr, the first Caliph of Islam. His grandfather, Hussein ibn Ahmad, and father, Baha al-Din Walad ibn Hussein, were renowned Islamic scholars of their time. In fact, Baha al-Din was such an outstanding Islamic scholar and spiritual figure that he was known as the Sultan ul-Ulama, or supreme religious authority of his age. Brought up in a family of scholars and spiritual guides, Rumi's education began at home under the watchful gaze of his learned father, who taught him Arabic, Persian, traditional Islamic sciences, and poetry during his early years. Since his father was widely revered by the people of Balk for his profound learning and spiritual attainment, young Rumi accompanied his father on his travels and in the process he met the leading Islamic scholars of the time. Rumi was influenced by his father's religious ideas and thoughts, and he, in turn, was heavily influenced by the teachings of the celebrated Al-Ghazali. As a vociferous opponent of Neoplatonic thought, Al-Ghazali launched a vicious intellectual attack on the thoughts of leading Falasifa, Islamic philosophers including Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, and championed the cause of Islamic traditionalism and Sufi thought and practices. Inspired by Al-Ghazali, Baha al-Din not only became a vociferous critic of Islamic philosophy, he also became a champion of Islamic spirituality, ethics and moral values and practices. His stance against philosophy pitched him against another great luminary of Islam, namely Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, who vigorously opposed Baha al-Din's attitude towards Islamic philosophy culminating in a huge controversy between the two men. But their rivalry came to an end in 1209, with al-Razi's death. Three years later, Bahadin left Balk for Nishapur, with his whole family in the wake of imminent Mongol invasion. In Nishapur, young Rumi encountered the celebrated poet Farah al-Din Attar, the author of the famous Mantik al tair The Conference of the Birds who gave him copies of his book and prayed for his family's well-being. From Nishapur, Rumi's family continued their journey and travelled to Baghdad and Syria, before arriving in Mecca in time for the annual Hajj, the pilgrimage. Rumi's family finally settled in Larinda, a small town in the province of Arzinjan, when he was around 18 years old. Here he married, and a son was born a year later. His family stayed in Larinda for a while before moving to Konya, the capital of the Turkish Seljuk dynasty, in 1229. Two years later, Bahaldin died, and Rumi, who was only around 24 at the time, was suddenly expected to shoulder all his family's responsibilities. As a gifted young scholar who was blessed with powerful imagination and sharp intellect, he soon became one of the prominent scholars of his locality thanks to his vast knowledge and understanding of Islam. Having already studied traditional Islamic sciences under the guidance of his father and his personal tutor, Sheikh Burhan al-Din Mahakik al-Darbidi, 
He was very keen to pursue advanced training in Islamic sciences. Accordingly, he travelled to Halab and Damascus, where he devoted the next seven years of his life to the pursuit of advanced Islamic knowledge. After completing his advanced education, he returned to Konya, where he lived with Sheikh Burhan al-Din, his former tutor and mentor, who encouraged him to engage in aesthetic practices in order to attain spiritual purification. He was barely 34 when he became widely recognised as a prominent scholar, a worthy successor to his preeminent father, and it wasn't long before he established his own religious school, delivered regular lectures on Quranic exegesis, tafsir, Islamic jurisprudence, fiqh, hadith, and aspects of Islamic spirituality, morals and ethics. His lectures became so popular that students came from across Konya to listen to him. Through his sermons on aspects of Islamic theology, jurisprudence and prophetic hadith, Rumi sought to encourage the locals, whether they were literate or not, to take their faith more seriously and bring up personal as well as collective reformation, thereby attaining success in this life and salvation in the hereafter. While he was busy lecturing on traditional Islamic sciences, suddenly there appeared a 60-year-old man who turned his life completely upside down clad in tatty and coarse clothes. This old man was both aggressive and possessed of a very domineering personality. He was Shams al-Din al-Tabriz, an ascetic Sufi, who had renounced all material comforts and pleasures of this life in favour of Sufi devotional practices. Hailing as he did from the family of Hassan al-Sabah, the founder of the infamous neo-Ismaili assassin sect, Shams, was a remarkable aesthetic whose piety and spirituality completely swept Rumi off his feet. Although his lectures on the religious sciences made him very popular throughout Konya, after his encounter with Shams, Rumi resigned his professorship at the local college and became Shams' full-time student and devotee. As an Islamic theologian, he had previously condemned music as being a blamesworthy activity. But now, he became obsessed with music, singing and dancing to the utter shock and surprise of the locality. The people couldn't understand why an outstanding theologian or religious scholar like Rumi would behave in such a flagrant and loutish manner. More importantly, the locals could not understand how an aged mystic like Shams could influence such a learned, sober and gentle scholar like Rumi into following his aesthetic ways. It goes without saying Shams was a charismatic figure who, having devoted his entire life to the pursuit of Islamic spirituality and Gnosis, had acquired a powerful moral and spiritual aura which clearly deeply affected Rumi. In other words, in the persons of Shams, Rumi saw what he did not perceive in others, the luminous light of divine love, compassion and mercy exemplified at its best. Shams became a mirror in which Rumi could see his own spiritual weaknesses, moral failings and physical frailties like never before. What he saw truly shocked and horrified him. In his obsession with Islamic law, he had overlooked the very substance of Islam. Thus, in the life and spiritual teachings of Shams, he discovered the true meaning and significance of Islam. But the more his devotion to Shams increased, the more his behaviour became erratic and unpredictable, which led to a huge row between Shams and Rumi's relatives, friends and students. They eventually forced the form out of Konya. But Rumi's separation from Shams made him so depressed and miserable that his son volunteered to go out in search of Shams and bring him back to Konya. His son found him in Damascus and then returned home with the aged mystics but the locals once again showed their profound hostility against Shams. Why? Because they felt he had misled and deceived one of their brightest scholars. But Rumi didn't see it this way. To him, Shams was the embodiment of purity, peace, spirituality and divine gnosis. And like him, he longed to attain the summit of Islamic spirituality. But the people of Konya did not share Rumi's profound love and enthusiasm for Shams and he was either forced to leave the city, or he may have been murdered, probably by someone close to Rumi. Either way, Shams suddenly disappeared, never to return again. His disappearance 
affected the 41-year-old Rumi profoundly. Indeed, many people thought he had gone mad because he refused to believe that Shams had disappeared. During this period, he became completely obsessed with singing and dancing, which the traditional Islamic scholars considered to be an abhorrent practice. But Rumi, Rumi found peace, he found solace and reassurance in Sufi music and dance, which he argued represented an expression of divine love and grace in its highest form. After many years of self-imposed suffering and emotional agony, Rumi eventually came to terms with his separation from Shams, thanks to a local goldsmith. One day, while he was dancing about in the street, he suddenly stopped upon hearing the rhythmic sound of the goldsmith's hammer. And then he suddenly regained his balance and composure. The beat of the goldsmith's hammer restored Rumi's physical and intellectual composure. He also began to refocus his spiritual energy in the pursuit of divine gnosis. After thanking the illiterate goldsmith for his timely intervention, he gave up his quest for Shams, for it became clear to him that he was in reality looking for none other than his own innermost self. So at the age of 54, he finally attained an inner peace and certainty which he had been seeking for a long, long time. It was during this period that Rumi's composed his immortal Mathnavi, which the renowned Persian poet and writer Abdurrahman Jami once referred to as the Persian Quran due to its sublime teachings and wisdom. It took Rumi nearly 12 years to dictate the 25,700 verses to his loyal friends and confidant Husam al-Din. Originally entitled Husam Nama, the Book of Husam, this monumental work later became known as the Mathnavi. Prior to the Mathnavi, Rumi composed another book of around 35,000 verses and odes in memory of Shams al-Din al-Tabriz. In this book entitled Davan al-Shams al-Tabriz, he explored different aspects of mystical love, questing and longing. But it was his Mathnavi which was destined to leave permanent marks in the history of Islamic literature. As a compilation of mystical teachings, spiritual exhortations and religious parables in the form of poetry, the central message of the Mathnavi was one of a universal divine love which transcended all artificial boundaries, sectarian denominations and crude cultural constraints. Rumi appealed directly to the very source of mystical love, the Lord Almighty, with an overwhelming sense of grace and humility, and in doing so he conveyed his universal message of love compassion and mercy to all people. Rumi's mysticism was a unifying force where divinity and humanity met rather than drifted apart. Through this, he hoped to promote mutual understanding and establish peace and harmony between people of all faiths, all cultures and all traditions. Since Rumi, like us, lived in an age when greed, anger, hatred and hostility led to considerable chaos, disorder, bloodshed and instability around the world. His message of universal love is as relevant today as it was during his own lifetime. Also, as a champion of human freedom and individuality, he constantly stressed the need of the attainment of true peace and liberation by moving closer to divine proximity. This coming together did not entail absolute union between the creator and his creation. Rather, according to Rumi, it represented the meeting of the lover with the object of his affection. Love, argued Rumi, was an innate cosmic feeling which cannot be experienced except by connecting oneself with the spirit of the universe. Nor can it be experienced by mere performance of external deeds and actions devoid of inner meaning and content. This universal message of love, compassion and mercy was therefore central to Rumi's mystical philosophy which he expounded in a masterly fashion in his vast collection of poetry and odes. Though Rumi was thoroughly familiar with Islamic theology and philosophy he didn't see himself as a theologian or philosopher per se. He was essentially a mystical poet arguably one of the most influential in history and his Mathnavi is today widely considered to be one of the most powerful and imaginative poems of all time. In total, he composed more than 70,000 verses of poetry in Persian. But as the founder of the Malawiya order of Sufism, 
he must also be considered as one of the most influential practitioners of Sufism, along with Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, Bahaldin Naqshband, Muin al-Din Chishti, and Abdul Hassan al-Shadhili. Known as the Whirling Dervishes for their love of Sufi music, singing and whirling dances, the adherents of this tariqa have been living in Turkey since the early Ottoman period. Revered in both the East and in the West for his remarkable poetic output, Rumi's ideas and thoughts have influenced scores of his prominent Islamic scholars, thinkers and poets like Abdurrahman Jami and Sir Muhammad Iqbal. Today, he has also become one of the most popular and widely read Muslim poets in the West, especially in the United States. Rumi died at the age of 66 and was buried in Konya, which is in present-day Turkey. 